So good evening and welcome to another WMCTC lecture. And thanks once again to the Royal Society of Chemistry and also the University of Birmingham for making these uh, or enabling these. And uh, we're also very honoured to, uh, to have a, uh, our speaker tonight is from the University of Birmingham, um, Professor Peter Fryer, who uh, some of you, if you've been before, have uh, known that when he, give, uh, when he gives this talk, in previous years, we've been in the Howarth uh, Lecture Theatre and there has been some free samples. So that's the one downside of this virtual event is that, unfortunately, you might have to have your own. But it's a very topical talk this evening uh, with Easter coming up and our thoughts of, uh, of chocolate associated with, with that. Um, we're going to turn our attention to how do you actually sort of manufacture and process uh, chocolate and confectionery. And um, so Professor Fry will have a look at that and also discuss some, some really interesting thoughts about the, the future of food as well. As normal, if you do have any questions, if you type them in the chat and then we'll address those at the end, we'll read those out and so everyone can hear the questions. So if you think of a question, just type it in the chat and we will uh, we'll read those through at the end. Uh, but with that, without further ado, um, Professor Fry has shared his screen and uh, thank you very much again to Peter and the committee. So enjoy the lecture and uh, I will see you again at the question. So thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, so my name is Peter Fryer. I'm um, Professor of Chemical Engineering. So I'm a chemical engineer rather than a chemist at the University of Birmingham. Uh, so I want to tell you tonight a bit about what we do, a bit about uh, how we make chocolate and how chocolate um, chemical engineers are involved in chocolate um, and some bits about what is going to happen to the food supply over the next 20 years or so. Um, it will be interesting to see what happens. Um, so um, I, I run a thing called the Formulation Engineering Center and, and what is formulation? And the easiest thing to, to, to say what formulation is, is um, this is what happens when chocolate making goes wrong. Um, when you find that uh, what happens, and we'll learn why later, um, the chocolate uh, that's been stored for too long or has been heated up and cooled down, that you go from this nice shiny um, edible material to something that's uh, much more dark and murky and looks sort of speckled like bird's eggs. Um, the reason for that is it's actually phase separated. All the bits of the chocolate have crystallized separately. Um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. The chemistry is the same, but the molecules aren't distributed in the same way as, as proper chocolate. Uh, and although it's edible, uh, the consumer doesn't like it. Uh, what happens is the, the melting temperature is above the mouth temperature, so the stuff tastes gritty uh, and feels quite peculiar. So you have to get the engineering as well as the chemistry to make things work, to make tablets of chocolate, slabs of chocolate, to make things like that. Oops. There's a lag on my computer, I'm going to have to be gentle with it. Um, and there's a mystical thing in chocolate called tempering, which delivers it in the right crystal form at the right time. Um, and one of the things about tempering is that chocolate um, cools, as chocolate cools, it shrinks. And you can see in this diagram here, the shrinkage, uh, the percentage contraction, uh, and in a proper chocolate, well-tempered chocolate, it uh, takes about 80 minutes. In badly tempered chocolate, it takes about a couple of hours. Um, and the process is designed to deliver chocolate uh, 
with a, a, a wait time, a contraction time of about two hours, if you're about an hour and a half, really, if you're not careful, if you deliver the stuff in the wrong form, um, you can't get it out of the molds, you can't make chocolate, the whole thing. It's a mess. So we have to worry about how chocolate is made, about how crystallization occurs, um, and how do you make these tablets properly work? Um, but if you can understand chocolate, um, then there are interesting things that you can do with all sorts of things. So Mondelez is a company we work with um, about making chocolate tablets. At the same time, we're working with uh, companies like Procter & Gamble on how to make detergent tablets, Bristol Mars Squibb and AstraZeneca uh, on how to make actual medical tablets. There's a range of, uh, once you have the techniques, you can use them in a whole range of different systems and chemical engineers uh, get jobs in, in, in good companies. Um, the oil industry uh, isn't as big in the UK as it once was. All the stuff is made in the Gulf and shipped out. So our graduates no longer go off to run ESSO. They go off to run Unilever, P&G and companies like that. So these are the sorts of places that chemical engineers will go to with the sort of skills that we've got. So if you understand uh, something like chocolate, you can understand how uh, the pharmaceutical industry, it's the same sorts of skills. You're delivering the pharmaceutical industries, delivering to your bloodstream or your skin. Um, the personal care industry is delivering to your teeth or your clothes. The food industry is delivering to the mouth and the stomach. You have to get the delivery of the chemistry right. And you have to make a product that people want to eat. Okay, the pharmaceutical industry doesn't really care about palatability, but you have to get it right in the food industry. So we've got a, a set of problems that have the same sort of structure. Come on, come on. Um, so let's look at the food industry and how the food industry works. Um, and uh, you can find the same uh, problems. Peter Garnsey, um, who is, was, is interested in uh, Roman food, says ordinary Romans got feet, meat through buying low-grade food from street vendors or in cookhouses and inns. Um, so the food industry has had the same problems for 2000 years, uh, the sort of equivalent of McDonald's um, is a really interesting question. And of course you can find the same uh, variety of container for olive oil uh, or for olives themselves uh, from uh, the far Eastern end of Turkey to about Hadrian's Wall, um, all of these things you couldn't get olive oil in Birmingham from the decline of the Roman Empire until about the rise of Marks and Spencers. So between 300 and 1975 AD, you couldn't get olive oil in this town. Um, so the techniques the industry uses are really quite straightforward and are all really quite old. Um, we have to think about uh, the sort of techniques that the industry uses. We have to think about uh, how it actually runs. Um, we will see, let's just give a click on this. I, that's what the previous slide, I think it's, we've got too many, too many things zooming. Um, just to remind people or tell you, it is the biggest um, industry in the UK. Um, by the time you've included agriculture 
It's got 14% of the people in the country in it. Um, and uh, in about 2018, when I got this slides, it's the food and drink industry is about 20% of UK consumer expenditure. It's a big industry. It's a, la a large and complicated industry. Um, and what is the industry struggling to do, or what are we all struggling to do, which is uh, how do you decarbonize the industry? How do you turn it off from, um, uh, fr from a a an oil economy and turn it into a, some sort of a circular economy? And the red line on the right hand side is what we are supposed to be doing, uh, World War III notwithstanding. Um, uh, and you can see that there is supposed to be a step change. There's always a step change uh, approximately during the time of the next government. Nobody's going to commit themselves to that. Um, but you need to look at the food industry and you need to look at chocolate in the light of trying to make ourselves uh, green and self-sufficient in energy. Um, and of course, if you look at how the energy system is working, um, uh, there's a big red line there. Uh, so emissions of power, so that's switching from coal and oil uh, to wind and so forth. Um, so three quarters of emissions reduced have been have come from the power sector. Um, it's really that electricity has got greener, not really that we have. Um, so we need to think about how to actually do these sorts of processes. How, what do we decarbonize? How do we decarbonize? And how do we make chocolate at the same time? Um, piles of things in the food industry. Um, I just pulled these off, um, uh, uh, off Google. Um, so there's heat, the food industry basically scales up what you do at home. So it's, it's heating, it's cooling, um, it's moving things around, it's making sure that they're clean. Um, so looking at food processes, chemical engineers look, look at processing, they look at how we process systems. You have to an analyze this sort of stuff. So what do chemical engineers do? Um, we look at the sequence of events. So what is the chemistry inside the process? What is the physics inside the process? Um, how can we do that efficiently to make one cream egg is um, it is confectionery, it is shopping, it is making it in a, um, in a kitchen. By the time you're making 10 tons an hour, you've got to hit all sorts of different processes. Um, one of the interesting things about working with the food industry um, is that some of these processes are, um, some of the limitations to what you can do are set by the physics um, or the biology or even by the consumer. There's no point in making a cheaper, more efficient chocolate that people won't like. They'll simply walk down the road and buy something else. Um, so for example, in baking, um, there's some water. You start with um, lots of things in the food industry, you start with a dry product, you wet it up and then you make it dry again. Uh, and baking is a classic one. You start with dry grains, and you end with dry bread, but you've dissolved the whole thing up with water in the middle. Um, and all the water added. Um, there's a step in chocolate manufacture called making chocolate crumb, um, where you essentially make a sweetened condensed milk powder, a glass and a half of milk. And this isn't a Cadbury talk, really. Any of the um, companies that make 
uh, chocolate have got to use milk powder, have got to use milk. Well, it, it could be from cow milk. It's increasingly from oats and almonds. You have to make this stuff into a form, into a powder that can be processed. And if it starts as a liquid, you have to evaporate it. And there's a pile of, uh, of energy usage uh, in that. Um, for example, um, if you go down the M40 uh, and you go past Banbury, you'll see a huge cloud of steam. And inside that cloud of steam is a, is a coffee factory uh, that makes Kenko and others. Um, and they start with dry coffee beans and you end up with dry coffee in um, jars or um, or little packs or things like that. Um, and one of the issues is every, every litre of water you add, you have to later evaporate. Um, they did at one point use a third of a million cubic metres of water, uh, which is an unbelievable amount of, of, of heat and energy. Um, and one of the things we did was help them make uh, evaporate less water by using less water at the start. So there's a lot of processing um, that governs how foods are used and how foods are made. Uh, and when you walk through a chocolate process, you have to think about the heat loads. What do we use? What do we have? So let's start with chocolate and chocolate of course starts with uh, dry beans. I hope many of you have been to Cadbury World uh, which makes a really rather good um, story uh, quite interesting. Um, so making chocolate involves a whole series of processes Some of whom, let's just hop, hop to that one. Um, so lots of processes that, lots of things in the food industry um, have been going for thousands of years. So people have been making bread uh, for 6,000 years, people have been uh, looking at processing those sorts of products. Chocolate processing is fairly new. Um, many or quite a lot of um, the uh, processes are uh, quite recent within, maybe not quite living memory, but pretty close. Um, so these are not it's not like baking or roasting something that's been around for thousands of years. It's about developing a, a project, about developing a process. So the process that's been developed um, is really then how do we deal with, how do we take the classical um, chocolate process from the Aztecs and if you've been to the first part of um, Cadbury World, all the Aztec South Americans uh, making it as a drink, and then it was a drink in the UK, and then gradually people used it, took a chocolate powder to make as a drink, and then gradually used it as a, a, a more and more solid product. So you roast and harvest, you harvest cocoa beans and you roast them. Um, it's important. Uh, there's a lot of argument about uh, fair trade. Um, some chocolate companies say it's fair trade, some isn't, but all of them are trying to make sure that the, um, the cocoa production is, is stable and sensible and uh, not exploitative either of the products or, or of the people who make them. Um, and cocoa contains a whole series of things called cocoa butters, which we'll fret about in a minute. Um, and you mix these things, the glass and a half of milk with added sugar, 
you make something called chocolate crumb and the Cadbury's make it uh, out where the cows are, um, out on uh, in near Lemster, a place called Marlbrook, also at Chirk, which is in Cheshire. Um, so they have two factories for this. Um, and you make, and there's where the energy comes in, you evaporate as a pile of milk to make this mystical thing called chocolate crumb. And then you start to make chocolate. So these lorries you may have seen uh, chugging on motorways. Um, if you trucked liquid milk into Bourneville, um, Bourneville would gradually fill up with water. So you evaporate the milk uh, deep in the heartlands of, uh, of, of the Welsh marchers. And then you bring it in uh, in these lorries uh, that are designed then to uh, unload the stuff as powder. So all of this is done and moved into Bourneville. If it was milk on its own, um, the Birmingham traffic would be even worse than it is now. So you have a process when you take chocolate, you take this powder that has been made uh, out in Wales, and you start to mix it, start to roll it. So um, a lot of these processes, it's quite difficult to work out what they do. Um, these were developed maybe 100 years ago. Um, it produces the taste of the material that people like. Um, but we have to be slightly careful what it is. Um, at the moment, uh, one of my colleagues is working with Cadbury on roll refining. So you pass the chocolate, you can see chocolate on the rolls. You can see then a sort of mixing process um, in which you, you conch it. It's called conch uh, because uh, basically the uh, first piece of kit looked like a conch shell. And you make something that is in the right crystal form and you then have to make sure that it is put into the mold in the right crystal form. So there is a chemistry bit that, and an engineering bit for how we make filled sweets and chocolates. Um, if you drive down the M4 um, and you pass Windsor Castle on one side, you'll see a long flat building on the other side, which is the Mars factory. Uh, they won't let me in because we work for Cadbury's. Um, all chocolate factories eventually along thin, they cool very slowly and they cool to make this stuff all in the right crystal form. What do I mean about crystal form? We have to make sure, recall the uh, photograph from the start of the um, lecture where uh, chocolate was in the wrong crystal form. It so if you get the wrong crystals forming, and you can see crystals uh, in the bottom picture, and you can see crystals in the picture on the right hand side, which is one, uh, a piece of chocolate that I bought from the university shop one October. Um, it's really it, most of the chocolate in the shop in October has been there since June. So it's been there over the summer and it's had a chance to bloom and you can see little crystalline structures. So we have to try and work out, firstly, how do you get chocolate to hit the right form that you want? And secondly, uh, can you do something sensible with it? So these are the sorts of things that you have to do to make a cream egg. Um, uh, so you start by putting chocolate into molds. 
and then you stamp out that mold and you can see on the right hand side a little mold uh, that is filled with chocolate and then you uh, apply an inner so put the cream in the chocolate give it a bit of heating on the surface and then attach tops and bottoms um historically this stuff is done in um you can see great big molds in the top picture so those are like um uh, the, 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 the ends of big, large books, and you ram those big, large books together. Uh, the top of the chocolate means the bottom of the chocolate. Um, and A, you can worry, you can imagine the amount of mechanical engineering you need to make sure these things meet precisely. You can imagine what goes wrong um, if the chocolate isn't at the right temperature to stick to itself. Um, and so if you're not careful uh, when you put these two together and give them a shake, um, either the base falls off or the eggs don't stick together or, or uh, they come out. You, you try and have a bottom tray and in the photo at the bottom there, there is a, a tray of finished ones. So you need to make sure that all the chocolates come out on the right side. If you get it wrong, you're up to your neck in chocolate at a very early stage. Um, and this again is stuff that basically is wasted uh, and, and can't wait. Some of it can be reused, some of it can't. So the chemistry bit, um, you know that uh, atoms form themselves into crystals. So crystals are solid materials in which there is a regular array of atoms and molecules. Um, and you can do uh, diffraction experiments. You can measure the crystal structure uh, by shining x-rays at these things. And people have been doing crystallography uh, for a hundred years or more, um, it's quite easy to do crystallography on something solid like granite or steel. It's a bit more difficult to do it um, with something like chocolate, uh, but we have to do it. We have to look at how chocolate behaves. Um, so um, carbon can occur in a range of structures. So carbon atoms can form themselves into graphite, or if you shave layers off this thing into graphene, but if you squeeze and heat very substantially, it forms a different um, variety. You get a different um, structure and you go from dirty, mucky graphite to, di to diamond. Um, the cocoa fats that are in chocolate, and there's an image of one, and you can see bottom left hand corner, it's a sort of soggy long molecule uh, with a bit of a kink in it. You can imagine that you could stack those in slightly different ways. Um, and of course you can. Um, so Diamond and um, graphite are two polymorphs of carbon, uh, but the formation of those is about 4,000 Kelvin apart. Um, cocoa butter, bless it, can go into six different forms, and it does them all between 15 centigrade and about 35 centigrade. So the chocolate process actually is a matter of getting all of these things to set in the right form. Um, some of these things uh, you look and it looks like there are almost sort of homeopathic tiny differences between different chocolates. Um, but you can see on the left hand side um, a, a diffraction pattern from different chocolates. 
um, starting from gamma and going up to beta, beta five and beta six. Um, and there are then photograph in the middle, uh, there are six different chocolates with different uh, behaviors. And the thing that makes chocolate really interesting from a processing point of view um, is actually that form five is the one we want, not form six. You have to stop this thing processing. You have to make sure you trap it in the five form. Uh, if you let it hit equilibrium, it goes through into the six form. And then you have something that actually, uh, you, you, that is the bloom structure. Um, you've got something that's thermodynamically stable, but it's a real, um, it, it's not what the consumer wants. So what you do in chocolate is you shear it, you mix it, and you try and grow crystals of the right form. Um, so one of the things that we did with Cadbury now a fair time ago is actually try and measure. So what happens to chocolate when you shear it? What happens when you mix it? What happens to the structure? So this is a set of measurements actually of melting points of chocolate. Um, and you can see on the right hand side, we start with, if you like, raw, um, untempered chocolate, and we mix it for different times, 100 seconds, 200 seconds, 400 seconds. And the melting point, the way in which the stuff sets, changes from bad to good, um, really quite sharply at 200 seconds of mixing, it's the wrong chocolate at 400 seconds of mixing. It's the right chocolate. So that's really quite valuable. You can do the same thing. I thought there was another slide. There is another slide. Um, so this is now um, 300 seconds, but at different stirring rates. And you can see you start with unstirred chocolate and you get bad chocolate and you stir it beyond about 35 reciprocal seconds and don't worry about the units. And all of a sudden you've gone from bad chocolate to good chocolate. So the job of the processor is to get this right on an industrial scale. Um, and uh, there's all sorts of complexities uh, that we need to understand in that. So what do the engineers do? Um, well, we want to try and predict the time that this stuff is done. We want to try and predict behavior. We don't want to spend time testing chocolate formulations, testing chocolate in molds. We want to be able to uh, do stuff quickly and more nimbly. Uh, so we built a computational model, uh, a model for the chemistry and how the chemistry happens in real time. Uh, it says in my um, contract, I have to put equations in. Um, the cheat, uh, which I thought didn't work, but turned out to work very nicely, um, is rather than model six crystal forms, we just model three. Um, so you can see behavior there in terms of stable and unstable chocolate, the pictures that you saw earlier. Um, and we build ourselves a model for how this thing works. We fit it to data and we try to see how you make a cream egg with it. So this is what uh, egg making looks like on a computer. So you can see 
Uh, first, we solved the um, equations inside a uh, chocolate shaped cell um, and it starts um, hot uh, and you can see red with a, a layer of blue solid chocolate on it and that chocolate cools down in the mold and you can infer, you can actually use those uh, temperature profiles to, to work out whether the stuff is tempered or not. And then you throw uh, chocolate, you, then you take uh, a filling and you can see, well, it's cold at the top in figure number B. Uh, that's worrying, but we can heat that up. You get a picture of how the mold behaves all the way through cooling. So if you get this right, you don't get the wrong temperature time profile. You get chocolate that is in the right crystal form and you don't have to spend time scraping the wrong chocolate out of kilometers length of molds. So you can build um, engineering models of chocolate um, and uh, the woman in charge of chocolate research at Cadbury um, is a Birmingham graduate and we've got uh, Birmingham graduates um, embedded throughout the system and our, some of our current undergraduate students are doing their intern year with Cadbury. And so this is the sort of thing uh, that you would do um, at university uh, if you start with chemical engineering. Um, and you can help to make how these things actually work. And of course, once you can model all sorts of complicated molding systems, um, so there's a thing called bubbly, which um, is a really rather beautiful chocolate. Um, the molding is beautiful. Um, you can see all the sorts of structures in it. Um, and that's the sort of thing that you can model using, uh, you model computationally, um, but you would have a real trouble trying to design it empirically. So you can deliver chocolates of different conditions. So where does chocolate sit in the whole structure of what's gonna happen to food? Let's just sort of uh, worry you a little about what's happening next. There's lots of talk about digital, about how chocolate, about how the food industry is going digital. Um, you can buy, uh, you can download books, you can download movies. It is quite difficult at this stage to download food. Um, it's not impossible. People are trying to use 3D printers. So you get a design centrally and then you 3D print your food. Um, the problem with that is um, making sure that the thing is clean and sensible. Um, but digital does all sorts of interesting things. Um, I put in this slide uh, this morning, having just filled up the car at something really rather expensive. Um, the UK food model um, is that you have one big factory and you truck everything around using lorries. Um, that's absolutely fine um, until the price of oil doubles or the price of transport doubles. Um, there are um, all sorts of issues uh, as has happened in the last couple of weeks when energy suddenly becomes expensive. Do we, can we afford these sorts of food mile issues, moving stuff around? I, I went to a conference <coughs> a couple of years ago in Melbourne and the pub that I went to to try and recover from jet lag um, had Carlsberg on draft. Um, you don't go 10,000 miles to Australia to drink Carlsberg. 
okay, the stuff was made locally. Um, 30 years ago in this town, there were no uh, breweries. They'd all closed and moved to Burton or moved to Denmark. There is now a local tradition. You can lose this local, this globalism and make stuff locally. And it's working with um, beer. It's working with bread a bit. It's beginning to work with chocolate as you shed the um, need to move stuff around. Um, I used to work for Unilever. We always said that the best thing, the best material to move around was the tea bag because the tea bag has is only 0.1% of the composition of the material. Uh, it's light, it's got all the flavor in it. Um, you, you, there's no way you would make drugs locally. Um, but whether it's actually sensible to bring water halfway across the world to sell in Birmingham supermarkets, frankly, I doubt. So we need to look at everything within the sort of structure of how um, the food manufacturing industry is going to look in five or 10 years time. Um, we did a piece of work trying to actually compare. Uh, so this is making it um, at home and this is making it at scale. So this is what your grandmother did or your great grandmother. This is what the industry does. And you can begin to see unit cost, production rate. There are all sorts of economics, maybe for chocolate, certainly for things like bread, that we can do most efficient locally. Um, the buzzword for this is distributed manufacture. Um, it's a bit uh, of a buzzword. It says, well, do you make stuff in a big factory and move it around? Um, the food industry is sort of struggling with that. So you can see here um, Thorntons and indeed Cadbury's have got chocolate printers. So you can print all sorts of structures. The one on the top is a pizza printer, which seems a bit of a waste of time to me. Um, but in a sense, we've already got um, local manufacture. So Pizza Hut get a pile of bits and assemble them locally. Um, is that more efficient in, a, uh, in an energetic way? Difficult to know, but it's being tried. So, the era of the big factory uh, may be coming to an end. Um, equally, people are beginning to look at alternative protein sources. Alternative protein sources is a sort of slightly cleaned up way of saying insects. Um, I don't think we will eat locusts on a stick. Uh, I can't manage it. Um, the sort of worms in a pate uh, are, are in, inside a biscuit at top left. I'm not so keen on. Um, everything, the pesto and the bread. Um, it, so everybody at this meeting I was at took the, the worms off the bread uh, and at the bread and the pesto. But the bread and the pesto are made from insects as well, using insect protein as a meal form. Um, and this begins to be ways in which we can make not chocolate, but you can begin to make foods in different ways. Um, you may have seen advertised in the last few weeks, um, Pizza Express, I'm not sure it's Pizza Express or Pizza Hut, Pizza Hut I think, PepsiCo, are, are putting artificial meats into the system. Meat as such is um, expensive environmentally. If you use um, different systems, the one on the left is a sort of cell culture. 
there's a startup at Birmingham from a colleague of mine um, who's just set it up with Aston, um, where you're trying to, they're trying to use cell culture methods, so sorts of tissue engineering methods um, to make meats, or you can do what's on the right hand side, uh, which is a sort of construct uh, that uses, actually uses GM, but they don't seem to want to tell you that, um, to make something that has the taste and texture of meat. And these are processing problems. Um, the Quest Meats, the new startup, is actually re recruiting chemical engineers at the moment. At the moment, there are four of them um, in uh, a small room somewhere in Birmingham. This time next year, who knows? This is a really big structural change in how the industry works, where you go away from agriculture and you build new systems. Um, so we've told you, I hope, how to make chocolate. Um, what do chemical engineers do? They build themselves models, some an, an understanding of how to make chocolate materials. Um, we're working, some of my colleagues have got a project on decarbonizing the black country. So how do you change systems that have been working on an oil economy and transform them into another, uh, into a decarbonized system? Um, and there are all sorts of interesting things happening in the food industry and you see them beginning to be advertised in the press about new sorts of foods and new supply chains and probably new products. So chocolate, I think, will still be with us, but all sorts of other things are going to happen at the same time. So there's a small hop through how the food industry works and how chocolate works in particular. I hope that was interesting. Thank you for listening. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much, Peter, for that, that excellent talk. And uh, I must admit, as you're saying, things like the, the uh, craft factory near Banbury, uh, I immediately could smell that coffee. And I, I did that journey quite often, and uh, I know exactly what you mean. And it just shows the, the, the huge scale. Um, and then the energy cost involved, all the sort of things that we're mindful of these days. And then as you strive for health, trying to replace fats or sugars with alternatives, it's uh, people don't realise that that obviously has a knock on effect with how you, how you process the food. Um, so really interesting topics. Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned, if everyone wishes to ask a question, if you put it in the in the chat, if you uh, type it in there at the moment, my chat. Oh, here we go. So um, I have a question saying, how can you make sure that the crystals are arranged correctly? So presumably the tempering as well as the crystals so, 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 in alignment. So you stir for the right length of time for the uh, under the right condition. Um, and so you start with the process, the conching process, the mixing process delivers the material in the right form. Um, and then you put it through a controlled temperature time cooling process. Um, there are ways, so there's a, a long old fashioned way of doing this, which is the way that most chocolate is made. There are ways of speeding it up, but really a lot of it is just giving it the right initial conditions and then waiting for it to, to cool in the right way. If you get it wrong, it's expensive. And uh, someone's also uh, asked, uh, thinking about moving from, uh, from main levels in, into university, um, essentially what are the sort of entry requirements? So would a chemical engineering degree require biology or physics? Um, do you know what the entry requirements are? Um, I, I, I'm maths. not. It, it, I mean, at the, the vast majority of people that we would look at 
would have probably standard physics, maths, chemistry. Um, maths, chemistry, biology is an equal thing. Um, I mean, it's, as you might imagine, a, a, a sort of savagely numerate discipline. So getting the, um, getting the maths, um, but you, you then apply the maths either to chemistry or biology. So some of my colleagues at the um, hospital in Birmingham are growing um, using engineering methods to grow, um, to grow tissues. Uh, you have to understand the biology to a to a, to a to a deep level. Um, so maths and chemistry, I think biology would be fine. Physics would be fine. I, I'm not sure what the current admissions numbers, uh, admissions conditions are. Um, simply, be, uh, if anything I told you would be a guess, and you're probably better looking them up because I don't want to get it wrong. I'm, I'm sure if you look on the University of website under chemical engineering, there should be a, an email address for the admissions team. I'm sure that if it's not on the web page, they would uh, be able to help you further. They, they will be happy to help. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, these, these things change. Yeah. And I know things that you mentioned interns. I know uh, experiences. It's very hard to get for, for students, but um, do you think there are um, now, obviously things are starting to open up after COVID, do you think there are more opportunities for people to do, um, not, not so much um, apprenticeships, but, uh, but the degrees that take part of it? It used to be a sandwich course, you could spend some of your degree in, in, in industry. I mean, there are um, universities that do straightforward sandwich courses, Chemeng, we try we do it with an industrial year um so you do your standard course but you take a year in industry these people uh, maybe about 30 30 percent of our students do that um and providing they like the experience and vice versa it's a bit like a sort of eight month um first interview um they tend to be very employable afterwards i must admit that's that's a great experience because it works both ways yes it's a eight month interview by half the company but it's also um a, a year which the student says well is this industry that i would like to go in um or do I want yes. to it's, it's, yeah. it's no it, it, it works in both ways um yeah, but yeah. we've got um, uh, we're, we, we are, well, I mean, anywhere you go would be well connected. We've got good links. Um, one of my colleagues who, who, who does the liaison job is, is, is traveling the country from sort of Newcastle to New Quay, um, that they're, they're, they're scattered around. Yeah. Excellent. And so it's a similar vein. Another question here, presume this, this relates more to the, the kind of course is, um, does Birmingham have a balance between practical and theoretical work? So I guess as part of the degree course. That um, I mean, it doesn't have. You do experimental work, you do design work, you do a research project that um, is getting back to being experimental though obviously over the last two years, everything has been theoretical. Um, you get the chance to get your hands dirty, um, learning the principles in practice. Um, it's not a, it's, it's not all practical, but some of the applied work, I mean, it's not all just solving exam questions, it's trying to work out so we've had students testing themselves, actually trying to design a chocolate line. Um, so that's taking the work that's been given in lectures and actually applying it. Um, and we get have links with the companies to make sure that those sorts of designs are sensible and people get a hang of what working in industry would be like. I was interested in your point about how um, 
the, the sort of local manufacturing and as you as you mentioned some of these sort of micro breweries uh, cropping up as well and these days you you see um a lot more sort of uh, independent chocolatiers than there there's were chocolatiers previously. there's bread there's breweries um you know it's it that they tend to be a bit high value but um you know there's lots of things that you can do in a local bread making factory where you don't have to think well this stuff could be sold in Inverness in three days time so I need uh, I need to add preservatives I need to think about shelf life if you make it and sell it local um, you can make you, you can make sure that you can use you can use methods for making stuff that tastes nice and maybe doesn't quite let last as long and of course the breweries um the big breweries would rather we drank lager that um has been pasteurized and can sit in containers for years uh, and the local breweries are making ales that are a, a bit more strong tasting but a bit a bit less long lasting so there's all sorts of interesting things going on it is. I think certainly we're all more aware of what's in our food and, um, and, and looking at the ingredients. Absolutely. Uh, thinking about, you mentioned there are a lot of water in the processing as well. There's a question here saying that, uh, uh, yes, a lot of water has been used to sort of dry, well, from dry ingredients, sweating them up, processing them, drying them again. And the question is, do you think there'll be a time where the wet stage can be uh, eliminated to make this process more efficient? you can drop it a bit um but i mean it, it's it, it, some of these things are actually needed for the chemistry i mean you if you just ground up you you can't make bread without making without making dough and you need water for the dough um you can't make bread without a bit of salt because you need salt to catalyze some of the reactions so People say, well, I, you know, there is salt in this bread. There's been salt in bread for 6,000 years. Um, so you, you can, you can't in the end be, you, you have to make sure that the chemistry and the physics is done in a really efficient manner. Um, but there are some limits you can't go through. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, I suppose there are other interesting techniques that are coming on. I remember, um, for example, uh, making decaffeinated coffee, removing the caffeine. You used to use very solvents, whereas now you yes, can use yes. li you know, liquid CO2. And yeah, uh, There's all sorts of, and, and, you know, the solvents were once quite dangerous. And um, the other thing about using... Um, if you use different ev evaporation methods or the liquid CO2, we have to be careful about adding things back. Some of the original low alcohol beers tasted disgusting because the flavours that had been put back were actually in real beers masked by the alcohol. Um, so you, you have to know what to put back, which becomes really interesting. And that's um, I mean, there are that people have written 10,000 page books on coffee chemistry. It's a it's a fabulous but rather difficult problem. Yeah. Something to worry about. It is indeed, indeed. Uh, does anyone else have uh, any further questions? I don't know. So these are appearing in my list. I don't know, um, other committee members, if, if you're a co-host, if you've got some other questions that I haven't read out. I don't know if there's anything on any other lists. Well, it always fascinates me watching um, this year's on television where uh, Greg Wallace goes to the factory and they, they look at various food manufacturing. And it's always amazes me not just the ingenuity of all the different processes and, and how it comes together um, but also just how much is is just in time and 
a lot of companies don't store the product for very long. Quite often it's sort of made to order and then as soon as it's made, it's, it's shipped out. It just seems to be that the industry is moving towards a, a, a really high efficiency. Which, which is fine until you get COVID. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the, the question of, we, we, I could have talked about resilience, you know, what do you keep in the, in the system um, and that, post covid is a really interesting problem how do you actually operate these these sorts of process to make sure that um um you, you've got you don't want to have huge warehouses of the stuff but if everything depends on two or three lorry drivers and all of a sudden they've got covid well you've seen the consequence um it, and and this is going to need some interesting thinking i think as to how how this happens going forward over the next decade or so um assuming we get transport back efficiently and then assuming we get people back post covid yeah absolutely that's interesting so i mentioned about uh, following on from the, the local supply change that um uh, do you think there'd be a, an increase or, as I say, sort of going back to sort of homegrown foods? I mean, for example, our, our grandparents had, had gardens and grew their own fruit and veg. Um, I, I do you think, think we'll go back to something like that? Maybe? I think something like that is going to happen. I think uh, your, your grandparents probably cooked on Monday and made stuff that would last for the rest of the week. Now, the moment energy becomes hugely more expensive and the last two two weeks are an interesting an interesting issue when when do you cook um in the in the second world war there were a lot of sort of um local joint kitchens so people said well i'll make everything on monday it may go depending on where we are with energy supply to that sort of structure um there are all sorts of 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 ways of doing things that we have i think in in practice forgotten a bit no it's, it's, it's very interesting absolutely I think, again, part of that makes you more aware of where your food comes from and, and also your energy uses. Absolutely. Yes, uh, the last the last six months have been salutary uh, uh, lessons in in um, in supply chain management. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But uh, but the start of COVID, I, I mean, I went back to making my own bread, making bread, which was, yes, it's, it's labor intensive and, and needing the dough is really good exercise. Um, it didn't last as long because I didn't put preservatives in it. Absolutely. But it yes. absolutely yes. fantastic. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so as you say, it's, um, it, it, it'd be interesting to see these things recurring and how we move forward. Absolutely. Uh, so I've got no further questions here. Um, if there are no further questions, I'd like to thank Peter once again for an excellent talk. I don't know if um, if Jill wants to say a few words. I'd just like to reiterate, Jill, thanks, Mark, to Peter. Um, most interesting and uh, related nicely, um, obviously, to what students are doing at school with like crystal structures, um, but also um, to their, all the sciences, not just chemistry, obviously, physics, maths. Um, biology um, and also practical considerations as well so uh, as well as the kind of whether you all want to go away now and have some chocolate maybe um, you've got it in your mind so thank you very much Peter much appreciated thank you, and thank you. we'll see you another time in the flesh and we might have some uh, chocolate samples to give out so thank who you. knows yes okay thank you very much indeed thank you much everybody. rest of the evening